And thank you. You may be seated. How many hymns focus on the day that we'll be with Christ? It's a wonderful, wonderful thought. When this poor, lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. It's coming for us all, and sooner than others, it's for some than others. But tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts 21. Tonight, the Lord willing, we'll be looking at verses 18 through 25. Skewed reports and weaker brethren. Acts chapter 21. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much for the privilege of being here tonight to study your word. We pray that by your mercy and grace you might help us to understand what's going on in this passage and that we might make the distinctions that the Apostle Paul clearly made and that the elders at Jerusalem understood. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Father, we commit this to you and pray for your blessings on your word tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall last week as we were finishing up, actually before we did hospitality, we were trying to finish up that lesson on predestination and prophecy, and then we took up hospitality. And let me just review that very quickly for us, because it gives us a foundation for what we're going to be seeing here tonight. You say predestination, prophecy, and hospitality. What does that have to do with skewed reports and weaker brethren? Well, I hope you'll see that in, in just a bit. First of all, we gave you some definitions. We talked about the definition of predestination. It's a good biblical word. So is the word election. So is the word foreknowledge. So we gave you some simplified definitions so that you can make a distinction between them. Predestination is to irresistibly determine a destiny. You're predestining something. A destiny or an outcome in advance, and it's based solely on the divine will and choice of God. Then we talked about election, and the Bible has a lot to say about the elect. That's to choose something or someone for a particular purpose in advance. And we learn that Christ is called the elect, the holy angels are called elect angels, Israel is called the elect, churches are called elect churches, and believers are called elect. That is to choose for a particular purpose in advance. So God determines the purpose. He says, the one I want to fill that slot is so-and-so, and he puts you or me or someone else into that slot for the fulfillment of a purpose. Foreknowledge is advanced knowledge of the future based on predestination and election not based on looking down the corridors of time and seeing what would happen and then adjusting your plans accordingly, but foreknowledge is based on predestination and election. And we looked at a number of verses, having predestinated us according to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, not most things, 
not even just the big things. It's all things after the counsel of his own will. God's will is sovereign in making the determinations that are necessary for history to fall into place where it will most perfectly glorify him. You see, his ultimate end, his ultimate aim, is to glorify himself, and indeed he is worthy. We would think of that if a human being was doing it as being proud, but God is worthy of glory. Human beings are not. We saw verses dealing with angels being the elect. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, 1 Timothy 5.21. We talked about believers who are elect, 2 Timothy 2.10. I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. God uses people to accomplish his purpose in drawing others to Christ who are among those who are elect. We saw Christ as the elect one over in 1 Peter 2, 6. Wherefore, also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. We saw churches who were called elect churches, and John writes to them in 2 John 1.1 1, 1 and 2 John 1.13, the elder unto the elect lady and her children. He's not writing to a woman, especially after you read that epistle, you understand that that's not what's going on. He's writing to a church. We see elect individuals in Romans 16.13, Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. We saw the choice, the sovereign choice of God, including his choice concerning salvation in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28. The purpose of God in election is stated there. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. We saw the timing of God's election, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We saw that salvation is by God's choice, not by man's free will, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. We mentioned that in passing this morning in the message. We saw service and warfare are the result of election. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And then we looked at hospitality last week in Acts 21, verses 15 through 17. After those days we took up our carriages, we went up to Jerusalem, and there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and brought with them one Manasin of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. We saw that hospitality was absolutely essential in the early church, and it is so today. We saw that churches met in homes, and we gave you multiple verses on that. We saw that traveling ministers stayed in homes, and we gave you multiple verses on that. We saw Bible studies being held in homes, and we gave you multiple verses on that. We saw that hospitality is required of elders. In fact, it's one of the 21 qualifications that are listed for elders when you read 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. There are 21 different things that elders are required to be doing uh, or be uh, being examples in in those two chapters. We'll not go over all of them, but it says that they are they should be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. And the word given to means addicted to hospitality. Over in Titus 1, 7, and 8, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, and temperate. <coughs> we saw that widows had to have exercised hospitality if they were going to be taken care of by the church after their husbands died. First Timothy 5, 9, let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. We saw that this is one of what's called an every believer gift. Every believer has this spiritual gift. The issue is whether or not we are exercising the spiritual gift. 
First Peter chapter four, use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift. Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What we have doesn't belong to us. Our homes do not belong to us. They belong to God. We're merely stewards of the places that God has given to us. We're stewards of the resources. No matter what resource you're dealing with, we're merely stewards of those things that God has entrusted to our care. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through 13, also makes it very clear that it's an every believer gift because it lists among all the things that all believers are supposed to be doing. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, con continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. That's an exhortation for all believers, not merely for some believers. We saw that hospitality, that gift, is given to every believer to increase love and unity of fellowship in the church. It's also to provide lodging and food for other believers who are in fellowship and to care for other believers who are suffering persecution or genuine needs. First Peter chapter four, verse eight, is what introduces that passage I read just a moment ago. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. So those verses state very clearly if you have a place to live, it's not yours, it belongs to God, you use it cheerfully on a regular basis for at least one of the three purposes stated in the definition. Number one, to increase love and unity in the church. Number two, to provide food and lodging for godly Christians. And number three, to meet the needs of persecuted and suffering Christians. We saw also that hospitality must be restricted to exclude those who teach false doctrine. Second John 1, 8 through 11. Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. And then we looked at several instances of hospitality throughout the scripture where we see tremendous blessing coming as a result of exercising hospitality. Think of the blessing that they received when the two on the road to Emmaus invited Jesus in for supper. Think of the Last Supper, some unknown follower of Jesus prepared a room for the Passover and then provided the entire Passover feast for 13 men, the Lord and his disciples. And we don't know the name of that one who offered the hospitality, but God knows and God has certainly rewarded him or her. Think of the blessing of Abraham received when the three strangers stopped by his tent, one of whom was the Lord himself. The text makes it very clear that one of those three was the Lord himself, and that would be what we call a theophany, or more accurately, a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament, as with Melchizedek, prior to the incarnation, where he comes down and communicates with men. Because of that hospitality, God revealed what he was about to do and spared Lot and his daughters. And then that final illustration of hospitality that we drew your attention to last week was in John 19. Jesus is on the cross. The soldiers have crucified him. They've taken his garments. They've divided them up into four parts, and they've decided not to rip his coat. They've decided to cast lots for it. And so uh, at the foot of the cross, there's Mary, the mother of Jesus, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and his disciples standing by whom he loved, and that's John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. Amazing. So much about hospitality in scripture that we often overlook or if we talk about it, we talk about it in other terminology, but it's there. And it's one of the things that God calls on us to use his resources in doing. There could have been a lot more things said, but I read a few verses in closing. It's commanded and it has hidden blessing, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality, a command in the context. In Hebrews 13, 1 and 2, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some 
have entertained angels unaware. And that brings us to tonight, the passage that immediately follows the old disciple Manasseh, uh, who lodged them. The day following, Paul went in with us unto James. They'd had a good night's rest at Manasseh's home. And it's skewed reports and weaker brethren. So the first thing, we've just read that passage, so I'll not read it again. But the first lesson that we learn is that the issue of the Jewish law is still with us today. The issue of Jewish law is still with us today. And we've talked about the different kinds of legalism. There are four different categories. I've divided it up for you. There is Jewish heretical legalism. There is pagan heretical legalism. Heretical legalism deals with the issues of sanctification. And then there is Jewish apostate legalism and pagan apostate legalism or Gentile apostate legalism, which is teaching the works of the law of Moses for salvation or teaching the works of men for salvation. So you've got four categories of different types of legalism. And we find a mixture of that as we look into our text tonight. The issue of the Jewish legalisms are in front of us tonight. Now that had been dealt with back in Acts chapter 15 and we'll be going back there as a, a reference back in just a few minutes because Paul is coming to James and the elders of the church at Jerusalem. And notice it says they were all present. Not just a quorum was present. The entire board, if you will, showed up for that particular meeting with the Apostle Paul and they were unanimous in the decision that they reached. So let's talk about that decision. They were also unanimous in their decision after that great debate that went on in Acts chapter 15. And they make reference to that, what they had decided six chapters earlier, back in Acts chapter 15, they make reference to that in this passage of scripture. So the first issue, Jewish law is still with us today. And we need to remember, as you have heard me say on many occasions, the church is not under the law. So what's going on here? Even though, as we have discussed, nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, but not the Sabbath. So the first thing we need to do is lay some foundational verses that I've not discussed so that you'll see where Paul is coming from in the way that he responds to the command that's given to the elders, uh, given by the elders, and why the elders give the command that they do. The first thing that we learn is that the law is not bad. There are those who are libertines who say the law is bad. That's not the New Testament position. We're not under the law, but the law is not bad. Paul says so. You see, we're not freed from the law because it was defective, but because the law has a distinct purpose that the legalists miss. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. The law is not bad and it's not defective, but it has a distinct purpose that the legalists miss. And Paul tells us what that purpose is in 1 Timothy Chapter 1, verses 5 and following. Now the end of the commandment is charity, that's agape love, that's God's divine kind of love. You know there are four different kinds of love in the New Testament. This is God's kind of love. So the end of the commandment, whatever you end up with, at the end of the day, based on what you believe, based on what are your motives, based on what you think, what you say, what you do, the end of the commandment is charity, agape love, out of a pure heart. It's not externally applied, it's internally motivated. It doesn't come because there's a set of rules, it comes because there is a change of heart. It's a heart that is a pure heart. Not a heart that has been beaten into shape by the law, but it's a heart that has been cleansed and purified by Christ. That's where he starts. The end of the commandment, when you get to the end of the day, what are you supposed to have? Agape love out of a true heart. Oh, something else. And of a good conscience. Did you know that the law will never give you a good conscience? Never. No matter how strongly you strive to keep the law, it will not give you a good conscience. 
There's always going to be some nagging sin at the back of your mind where you realize you didn't really keep the law 100%. The end of the commandment is charity, agape love out of a pure heart, and secondly, a good conscience. How do you get a good conscience? Hebrews 9.14 those things that keep coming up, the devil keeps bringing them back, keeps tormenting you with them. How do you get rid of them? It is not by keeping the law. Hebrews 9.14 tells you how. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, now listen to the next phrase, purge your conscience. Clean up your conscience from dead works. All those things that torment you every time you think about them. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You're not serving because the law demands it. You're not serving because you've got a tormented conscience. You're serving out of a pure heart. Because the blood of Christ has not only cleansed your sins, the blood of Christ has cleansed your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's a wonderful verse. Every time the devil brings something up and you're busy trying to serve the Lord and the devil says, well, how can you serve God? Do you know what you did? Do you remember what you did? And we shrink back. And there's pain. How much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse it? So that you can serve the living God. It's a magnificent promise, people. It's an incredible promise. That the blood of Christ not only cleanses you from all sin, it cleanses your conscience. It's the second thing we find here in 1 Timothy. We're going to see how this ties into the law in just a second here. There's a foundation for what's going on there in Acts chapter 21. And the third thing says, and of faith unfeigned. At the end of the day, when all is said and done, what should you have? Three things. Number one, a charity out of a pure heart. Number two, a good conscience. Number three, genuine faith. Faith unfeigned. You're not having to fake it. So many believers go through life faking faith and people who are truly saved. Paul is writing this to Timothy. Timothy is saved. But he says at the end of the day, you won't have to fake it. You don't have to put on the mask. You don't have to go through life pretending to be the good guy when you know that not everything is right. You don't have to pretend to be trusting God when really in your heart you're not trusting God. You're trusting some other provision that you've made on the side just in case God doesn't come through. The third thing that's the end of the commandment is genuine faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 who are blessed. God can see genuine faith. We can fake it and, and make other people think that we're walking by faith when in fact we're not walking by faith. We have other motives behind doing what we do. We're going to try to accomplish something or get something because we are faking it. But at the end of the day, if you're doing it right, <laughs> it's genuine faith that comes through. Now he gets to verse 6. And here we begin to see the problem. The same kind of problem that we're running into in Acts chapter 21. From which, that is from these three things, the pure heart, love out of a pure heart, good conscience and faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Think about this. Think about a bunch of out-of-tune gongs all whacking together at the same time. Cacophony, horrible noise, not beautiful music at all. Instead of listening to the beauty of the melody and the harmony and the rhythm, the three things that are listed in verse 5, 
of beautiful music. Some people have said, we don't want that. We'd rather have the rock band on the stage with the wiggling bodies and the flashing lights, wailing on those loud guitars with amplifiers. They've turned aside and the vein jangling. And what is their vein jangling? It tells you in verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law. Paul's warning Timothy, you're going to run into it. Now, different groups of people with different backgrounds have different problems, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But the problem at Jerusalem was, you see how many Jews have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. That was their thing. That was their background. And before they'd sort of been maybe wishy-washy, namby-pamby about the law, but they knew what it was. And they knew God had given it at Mount Sinai. And suddenly they got saved. And so what do they latch on to immediately? They latch on to what they have been taught, which is the law. But Paul says here, there are those who desire to be teachers of the law. And, and there are some believers who have swerved aside unto their loud bangings. Think of a bunch of tin cans whacking around in the wind. Understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now remember my proposition. The first thing I said was the law is not bad. We are not freed from the law because it's defective, but because the law has a distinct purpose that the legalists miss. And Paul tells you what the purpose is in the next few verses. It's not bad. Paul says, verse 8, we know that the law is good. So right off the bat, we can throw out, that's a false straw man argument when people say, well, you're saying that the law is bad. And we know that the law is not bad. They try to use that to put down people who say, you as legalists are out of line. Paul makes it clear. We know that the law is good. But then there's a phrase that's extremely important. If a man use it lawfully. There is a lawful use of the law and there is an unlawful use of the law. The law is good if it is used for the appropriate purpose. If a man use it lawfully. And he tells you what the purpose of the law is. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. First thing is we exclude a certain category of people for whom the law was not made. The law is not made for a righteous man. We, when we trusted in Jesus Christ, received both imputation and justification. It is by imputation that we are made righteous. It is by justification that we are declared righteous. And there are two categories in which we are declared righteous. We are declared righteous before God and we are declared righteous before men, but by different means. We are declared righteous before God by faith and by faith alone. God declares us righteous because he has made us righteous and he has placed us in Christ and God sees us now through the lens of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Christ, our sins have been forgiven. That's imputation being made righteous and God then declaring us righteous because we have been made righteous from the divine perspective in Christ. But James deals with the other half of the equation. We are declared righteous in the sight of men by what they can see. How has divine righteousness transformed our lives? And we talked about the transformation of the life this morning. A person who is truly saved will be undergoing a process whereby day by day we are being more closely conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, whereby we reflect him more perfectly in our thoughts, words, deeds, motives, and attitudes. Five, five different areas in which God begins to transform you. 
and people around us can see whether or not we're hypocrites which is we say one thing with our mouth but do something else with our lives as those two areas get closer and closer together our testimony for Christ before men becomes powerful so what Paul says about the, good, the law here is it's not made for a righteous man that's why you and I in Christ are not under the law but he tells us what the law was made for it's for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners for unholy and profane for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers for manslayers for whoremongers for them that defile themselves with mankind that is sodomites for men stealers that's kidnappers for liars for perjured persons swearing under oath to that which is not true and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine in other words Paul doesn't give you a full list but he gives you a set of categories in which you can see what the law is made for but it's not made for a righteous man that's the apostle who is going to be doing some things that are related to the law in Acts chapter 21 anything that is contrary to sound doctrine so the law there is a lawful use of the law and there is an unlawful use of the law a good illustration of that is just like a policeman who can use the law for purposes for which it was given or he can use the law to make himself rich and powerful he can pull people over to give them speeding tickets for example and uh, through the conversation at the window of the car you pull out your license to show him and he says you know I really could give you a ticket here and it'll be my word against your word in front of the judge and I can say that you were going 50 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone and you'll be hit with a fine of about four hundred dollars for doing that there are a lot cheaper ways of going through this process right now and you begin to understand what he's asking you for is a bribe you think that this is not reality it is though perhaps not as much in this country as in other countries I was down in Mexico many years ago I had taken a group of our young men down to help some missionaries down there building a Christian school and every day we uh, laid brick and you know put in rebar and things like that helping build a wall around the school and um, one day we were out riding with one of the missionaries and uh, we pulled up at a stoplight behind a, a coca-cola truck and the policeman before he waved you through the policeman shook his baton at the driver of the coca-cola truck and so the guy just sort of sat there sweating we were behind and so we saw all of this taking place right in front of us the policeman walked over to the side of the coca-cola truck pulled up one of those rolling sides took out two bottles of coke pulled it down and waved the truck driver on <laughs> there is a lawful use of the law and there is an unlawful use of the law the same is true with divine law as well as with human law the second thing that we see here in our text is beware of slanted reports beware of slanted reports if you're ever in a position of leadership you will discover that there are people who bring you slanted reports in other words the speakers have an agenda that they're trying to accomplish and so they give you a report that you know probably doesn't have all the facts or it has the facts twisted in such a way that you will tend to lean toward the conclusion that you want that they want you to lean toward beware of slanted reports which means you get the facts first and compare the facts with God's standards before you make your decision here in this text Paul had nothing to hide did you notice he was not trying to work behind the backs of leadership he went immediately to the leaders as soon as he returned to Jerusalem verse 18 says and the day following Paul went in with us unto James and all the elders were present 
In every church, there are people who try to work behind leadership. People who try to, to gain followers, and I've told you many stories of different churches I've been in in the past, so I won't repeat them here. But in every church, there are those who work behind the back of leadership to accomplish their own ends. And they don't come to the leadership to ask permission, they just do. They don't come to the leadership to make reports, they just do. And they get other people along with them, doing with them, so that if leadership says anything about it, then innocent people also get blamed. Every church has them. It's, it's human nature. So what's going on here. But Paul had nothing to hide. The third thing we learn is wise leaders let those who are under attack make their presentations before revealing the problems and making a judgment. Wise leaders let those who are under attack make their presentation before revealing the problem and making a judgment. Verse 19 says, and when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Now, the problem was already brewing. The leaders in Jerusalem knew the problem was already brewing, but they didn't say anything about the problem until Paul had made his report. Paul explained in detail what had been going on while he was on the mission field. You know, a lot of times missionaries come back home and other reports have reached leadership at the office about what's going on in the field because there are people out there who don't like what the missionary is doing. Other missionaries, perhaps, who have an agenda would rather do something else. They send reports back home and, folks, I've dealt with all kinds of missionaries over the years, lots of independent mission groups. And I tell you, there are a lot of bad reports that come back from the field. It's always best to find out from the horse's mouth what's going on before you say, now, how do we deal with this issue? The elders at Jerusalem were wise in that. Fourth, wise leaders find the good and commend those who have done the good for their service. Verse 20 says, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. You see, already they've dealt with the issue, should Paul be going to the Gentiles? That's not a problem. Now the problem is, Jews who are out there among the Gentiles are sending back reports about Paul because there are Jews out there who don't come to the same conclusion that the church at Jerusalem had reached when the Apostle Paul, actually going back to Peter in Acts chapter 10, when God declared through Peter's vision on the housetop that the Gentiles were now going to be part of the same body. And Cornelius and his household are brought in to the one body. There are not two bodies, a Jewish group of believers and a Gentile group of believers. There is one body of Christ. But there were those out on the mission field where Paul was going and saw this Jewish guy coming out and preaching to the Gentiles and Gentiles becoming Christians and then they're getting all these weird reports and the Gentiles don't know anything about Jewish law and the Gentiles aren't doing the things that they thought ought to be done. So they assume that this is what Paul is teaching. Get your facts first. Now, the leaders were aware of the rumors that were going around, and let, let me just encourage you to, to understand that. Leadership, unless it's really out to lunch, and sometimes there are churches with leadership that's really out to lunch, but leaders are usually aware of the rumors that are going around. I've brought up some of those in congregational meetings in the past. I said, you know, there's a rumor going around in this church, and I had some people looking rather shocked that I knew about it. But as they are aware, they are usually prepared with a plan to set things straight. Verses 20 and 21. When they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are zealous of the law, and they are informed of thee. So telling Paul what is being buzzed around in the church at Jerusalem. And there are thousands of Jews in the church at Jerusalem. And here's what they're talking about, Paul. They're informed of thee. Somebody has told them that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles. Because remember, Paul, you're out there among Gentiles. And so you're in contact with Jews out there. Remember where did Paul always try to go first? He went first to the synagogue. Yeah, that's right. Went first to the synagogues. He gave them the first shot at it. And then he preached to the Gentiles. 
That was his standard method of operation. So the Jews are looking at that, the ones that are out there on the mission field, and some of them weren't very happy about it. So they say, you teach the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses. Forsake Moses! Now, that's sort of a twist, isn't it? Is there anything in Moses that we as believers ought to be paying attention to? Yes, there are. Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children. They've dealt with that issue before. Remember, circumcision was one of the big issues in the church. It's not a big issue today, but it was a big issue in the early church. And we did a whole series of three lessons where we dealt with the problem of circumcision and all the places in the New Testament talks about circumcision. Neither to walk after the customs. Ah. <laughs> See, there were Jews out there who weren't just concerned about Moses, who weren't just concerned about circumcision, but they were concerned about the hedge about the law. Those 613 extra little rules and regulations that were given so that if you followed all those little rules and regulations, those were the hedge that would keep you from breaking any other part of the law. The next thing we see here is that James and the elders state two things. They state the blessing and they state the problem associated with the blessing. Did you know with every blessing there come problems? Most of us don't like that. We like the blessings. We don't like the problems associated with the blessings. Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. That's a blessing. It was a blessing to have many new believers. It was a blessing to have many new Jewish believers. They already had a foundation laid for them in the Old Testament, which pointed to Christ. And we talked about what Paul would do in relation to those Jewish synagogues where a whole group of, of Jews would come to Christ. They already had background that Paul didn't have to teach. That's a blessing. The problem was they are all zealous for the law. Just remember that every new believer comes with baggage attached. The Jewish believers came with baggage attached that related to three different areas of the law. Moses, circumcision, and the customs. But you know, Gentile believers also came with different baggage attack, attached. And as you read the epistles to the various Gentile churches, like 1 Corinthians and Romans and so on, you discover that the baggage they had attached was rampant fornication, polygamy, meat offered to idols, vegetarianism, and so on. And a couple of those things are mentioned here because they were dealt with back in Acts chapter 15. The Jews came with the baggage of ritualism, placing themselves not only under the moral law, but under the ceremonial law. And the laws related to the foreshadowing of Christ, the topology and they wanted to hang on to the things that were foreshadowing, things that had been done away with in Christ, because Christ had come. And it's almost like a soldier who's gone away to battle, and he's left behind a picture of himself, and every day his, his wife lovingly takes the picture and tenderly embraces it and kisses the picture. And her husband comes home from the war. He's been gone for two or three years, and she's not there at the airport to meet him. So he gets home, and at home he finds her tenderly hugging and kissing the picture. And he says, sweetheart, I'm home. And she says, oh, yes, but just a minute. I love my husband so much. And kisses the picture. The Jews were holding on to all the typology. Instead of holding on to Christ. All the things that foreshadowed him instead of holding on to Christ. They didn't get the picture yet as to what was grace and what was not being under the law. They didn't understand that we're motivated by our love for Christ, not motivated by the law at Sinai. Let me give you a few verses on that. Romans chapter 3, verses 19, and Romans 6, verse 14. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. He's just talked about those who, have, who are not under the law. They're guilty for different reasons. But those who are under the law 
God stops their mouths with the law. The law is not made for a righteous man. And they are not righteous by keeping the law. That every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. It is not the law that frees you from sin. The law only condemns you. It is the grace of God that frees you from sin. Verse 15, the next verse, what, sh what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. That's not a reason for breaking the law just because you're not under the law. That's not a reason for committing sin because you're under grace. That's lasciviousness when you do that. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Grace and faith go together. Law and works go together. Grace and faith result in blessing and freedom and justification. Law and works end up in condemnation and bondage and slavery. Chapter 4, verse 4. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. God bought us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. <clears throat> He deals with that problem all the way through the book of Galatians and we'll look at all the verses, but there were those who wanted to be under the law and Paul deals with that in chapter 4. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? If you want to be under the law, you're in trouble. Verse 18 of chapter 5, if you led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. You see, there are certain things that go together as a package and there are other things that go together as a different package. And if you have a choice between the two packages, and you do make a choice, you trust Christ, and then you decide, which package do I want? Do I want the package that is full of law and condemnation, and always struggling and always striving and never making it perfect, only getting condemned? Do I want that package? Or do I want the package that deals with faith and grace and with the Spirit of God? which is a totally different motivation for wanting to serve Christ and for wanting to live a pure and holy life. You can take this package and say, I'm going to live a life of holiness by keeping the law. Or you can live this life that says, I'm going to live a life of holiness because I love Jesus and because the Holy Spirit empowers me to do it and I don't have to do it in the flesh and the Spirit of God will transform my life. Now, which package are you going to choose? It's a very important choice. And many believers... Many, unfortunately, within the Reformed tradition have chosen the law package. They're going back to some of the Galatian heresies. You can't do it. Now, what Paul is doing here in Acts chapter 21 is a visible expression of the doctrinal truth which he taught in 1 Corinthians. Remember, they've said to him, now, look, Paul, the Jews all hear these reports about you that you're really, really bad out there. You're breaking the law all over the place because you're working with Gentiles. And so you're teaching the Jews that they ought to break the law all over the place because you're working with Gentiles. Here's what Paul said about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. Why does Paul go, and there are two reasons for it. We'll talk about those in a second. But why does Paul go with those four men who had a vow, into the temple and pay their, pay their dues, if you will, and go through the process with them. Well, first of all, it's to stop the mouths of the Jews who say that Paul didn't do what the law required. And secondly, it was what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. Remember the title of the message, Skewed Reports and Weaker Brethren? Paul is going to be dealing with an issue with, of weaker brethren here. All those brand new believers who are zealous for the law, they're weaker brethren. 
So, unto the Jews he became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. He's not being a hypocrite. He is simply restricting his own liberty. And it is always appropriate to restrict your own rights, your own freedoms, your own liberty for someone who is a weaker brother. He's not being a hypocrite. He's not compromising. He's restricting freedoms that he has. Most of us do not want to restrict our own freedoms. We would instead prefer to exercise our own freedom and let the chips fall where they may. It's not what Paul said. Under the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 21. To them that are without law, that's the Gentiles that he's going to, as without law, and then a parenthesis, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. What is the law of Christ? Paul explains it. It's the law of love. James talks about it too. The law of love, where love comes first. Love for Christ, which results in love for the brethren. Where you don't want to do anything to be offensive to Christ, and therefore you don't want to do anything that is offensive to the brethren. It goes back to restricting our rights. We as Americans always want to insist on our rights. We're a free people and we'll do what we want. We're dealing here with the issues of saying, I'm willing to give up some of my rights so that I can help other Christians grow, so that I won't leave them where they're at, still holding on to their unfortunately babyish and carnal ideas. Are you willing to give up your rights for the sake of weaker brethren? That's what Paul's doing in Acts chapter 21. Let's see how he's doing it. What was Paul doing back in Jerusalem? We were told earlier that Paul had had a specific kind of a vow, right? He had a Nazarite vow. Do you remember us discussing does anybody remember us discussing Nazarite vows? Wow, wonderful. A whole bunch of hands raised. I'm glad to hear that. The Nazarite vows of the Old Testament, which you would take for a period of time. And we talked about the different time lengths that Nazarites took their vows for. And some were Nazarites their entire lives. Their parents had dedicated them to the Lord and made them Nazarites at the moment of birth. And so, for example, they never cut their hair. And they never touched grapes or grape vines or drank grape juice or wine or anything else that related to that. There were a whole bunch of different things that related to the Nazarite vow. We saw that Paul had a Nazarite vow. And Paul was fulfilling a vow that he had made. Coming under grace does not dissolve vows that you have made. Becoming a Christian doesn't break or give you freedom to break vows that you have made. It's very important in the context, for example, of marriage. And Paul deals with that problem over in 1 Corinthians. Because there were those in, in Corinth who were saying, wow, I used to be a pagan, I married a pagan woman or I married a pagan man, and, and now I'm a Christian and I want to be married to a pagan. So it's okay because you know we're not supposed to be unequally yoked for me to divorce them and get rid of them. And then I can go marry myself, myself a Christian. No, you took a vow. The Apostle Paul spends three chapters dealing with that type of an issue. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul had made a Nazarite vow, and now it's coming to an end. And that's clearly the context of what's going on here. Because in verse 23, it says, Do therefore this that we say unto thee, We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads. What kind of a vow do you think they had? It was a Nazarite vow. The elders there at Jerusalem, obviously Paul had communicated to them that that was the reason he'd returned to Jerusalem, why he was so insistent on returning by a specific point in time. He was going to complete his Nazarite vow. 
it didn't dissolve when he became a Christian. But it was for a period of time. It was not for life. He was coming back to Jerusalem so he could fulfill the law. And by doing that, he could prove to all those who were bad-mouthing him that he was not teaching people, go break the law. All you Jews out there that you've got certain obligations, go ahead and break the law. It doesn't make any difference. You're Gentiles now. No, they were not Gentiles. They're still Jewish heritage. Many of them had obligations that they had made under the law. And Paul is showing, that's why the elders told him to do this. He was showing that by doing that, that the reports that have been brought against him were phony reports. That all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Remember what Paul had said? Under the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. So them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. The purpose is not to declare our rights, to cause divisions, and to make offense in the church. The purpose is to help baby Christians grow up and be full mature Christians. And Paul deals with that. The Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 had already dealt with the problems. The problems are listed down there and our time is running out, unfortunately. Verse 25, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. That's the baggage that the Gentiles came with. Jews came with one set of baggage. Gentiles came with another set of baggage. Every church and every culture, no matter where you are in the world, comes with baggage. You go to a polygamous society, people start coming to Christ, and you've got men out there who have five, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen wives. What are you going to do with it? Missionaries wrestle with that kind of problem all the time. Certain areas are considered sacred. What do you do with it? They're still afraid of certain spirits. What do you do with it? They're involved in certain kinds of cultural practices, like if you go to the Inuits, or at least 100 years ago, the Eskimos, we call them. Anytime a man was traveling and uh, you know, a snowstorm came up, he'd stop with the local Inuits and they would share their wives with him. You have to deal with those things because people who have never known the true God have practices that are evil. Now, they'd already dealt with the problems at Jerusalem. Now, I want to spend some time talking about weaker brothers and why weaker brothers should not always remain weaker brothers because weaker brothers who remain weaker brothers are able to control the church with their carnality. What Paul is doing is helping weaker brothers grow up here. So that they will listen to him. And so that he'll be able to teach them the things that he taught throughout the New Testament. Paul writes to the Corinthians about how some of them were still carnal. There are those who are the natural men, that is unsaved. There are those who are saved, but they're carnal. They are still babes. They're still drinking milk instead of strong meat. And there are those which are spiritual. And Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians 3. He deals with that in Romans chapter 14. He deals with that in relation to, to the, the hang-ups that people have. We find it in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We find it in Romans chapter 2. There are many places, and we don't have time for that tonight, but the Lord willing, we'll pick it up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power. We thank you for the things that you have taught us there. We thank you, Father, that you've taught us that we, if we are mature, should be willing to give up our rights for the sake of weaker brethren so that we might win them, so that we might help them grow, so that they might understand and then live lives of freedom in the grace of God by faith, empowered by the Spirit of God and not by the law. Father, help each one of us to take and apply these things for each of us knows the particular areas of life that we need to apply it to. Help us to realize that the blood of Christ not only forgives our sins, but it cleanses our consciences too. And that we can walk joyfully in the power of the Spirit of God by faith. And we can serve 
by faith empowered by the Spirit. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 97, one we have not sung in a while, so I thought we'd sing it. Sing praise to